It is 2 p.m. in New York, 7 in London, and 4 on the first Monday of March here in Seoul. I'm Moon Ga Young. You're watching Arirang, Korea's only global network. Now, North Korea fired two more short range missiles off its eastern coast on this Monday, just a matter of days after he fired four short range missiles from the same location. South Korea's defense ministry said the North launched two Scud missiles into the East Sea at around 6.20 a.m. Korea time and that the missiles flew at least 500 kilometers. Now, the missile launch comes amid Seoul and Washington's annual joint military exercises, which Pyongyang opposes. A South Korean official said this latest string of missile launches may be North Korea's attempt to ratchet up military tensions in protests against the joint military drills and that Seoul is keeping a close watch in a case there are any additional provocations. Meanwhile, President Park says her vision of a unified Korea will go beyond overcoming division to creating a new future for the peninsula, Northeast Asia and the world. Speaking at the Asian Leadership Conference in Seoul Monday, the president said there would be no fear of a war uh, or nuclear threats in the unified Korea, but freedom and peace which Koreans can enjoy. President Park then reaffirmed her recently announced commitment to set up a presidential preparatory committee for reunification. The Korean president also met with former U.S. President George W. Bush, who was in Seoul for Monday's conference and thanked him for continuing his diplomatic activities to strengthen the Korea-U.S. alliance. Meanwhile, Red Cross representatives of North Korea and Japan have started a new round of working level talks in northeastern China on this Monday. Government officials from the two sides who are also taking part in the meeting are likely to discuss the possible repatriation of Japanese nationals abducted by the North. Our Connie Kim reports. Red Cross talks between North Korea and Japan kicked off Monday morning in the northeastern Chinese city of Shenyang. The talks, the first since November 2012, will focus on the repatriation of the remains of Japanese nationals who died in North Korea during World War II. The three-day talks will be led by Ri Horim, Secretary General of the North's Red Cross Society, and Osamu Tasaka, Director General of the International Department at the Japanese Red Cross. However, with Geichi Ono, director of the Northeast Asia Division of the Japanese Foreign Ministry, and Nyu sung Yeo, chief of the Japanese Affairs Section at the North Korean Foreign Ministry, also attending the Red Cross meeting, there is speculation the two sides may talk about Pyongyang repatriating Japanese abductees still alive in the north. The Japanese government believes 17 nationals it believes were abducted by North Korea in the 1970s and 80s, but suspects Pyongyang may have kidnapped more Japanese nationals. Five abductees were repatriated to Japan in 2002. Japan has been requesting North Korea reinvestigate where the abductees are, and North Korea is continuing to urge Tokyo to compensate for the suffering of the Korean people during Japan's brutal colonization of the Korean Peninsula in the early to mid 20th century. The Japanese government will address current outstanding bilateral issues, including the abduction of Japanese nationals, and will attempt to bring a proactive attitude out of North Korea. In what could be a first step toward resuming full blown, official discussions between North Korea and Japan, eyes are focused on whether the Red Cross meetings will lead to formal bilateral talks between the two governments. Back in 2012, the first government-level meeting between the two countries was held in four years after similar Red Cross discussions, but follow-up talks were scrapped after North Korea launched a long-range rocket. Connie Kim, Arirang News. When the latest news meets the latest business stories, we give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Business Today with Moon Gon Yong, every weekday, only on Arirang. Now, over in Ukraine, tensions remain sky high and new developments are unfolding by the hour. Now, the group of seven nations have condemned Russia for invading Ukraine and canceled preparations for an upcoming G8 summit. Our Shin Se-min reports. The international community is stepping up pressure on Russia to pull its troops out of Ukraine, but Crimea is under the control of Russian soldiers. 
The group of seven major industrialized nations on Sunday condemned Moscow's invasion of Ukraine and even canceled preparations for an upcoming G8 summit scheduled to take place in Sochi in June. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who will arrive in Kiev on Tuesday, has condemned Russia for what he called an incredible act of aggression and warned that the country has a lot to lose if it presses on with its current course of action. Uh, there could even be, ultimately, asset uh, freezes, uh, visa bans. Uh, there could be certainly a disruption of any of the normal trade routine. Uh, there could be business drawback on investment in the country. The U.S. Congress has already called for sanctions against Russia. Russia's parliament has already given the green light to its president, Vladimir Putin, to use military force to protect its citizens in Ukraine, defying calls from the international community not to intervene. Over the weekend, Ukraine mobilized its forces for a possible confrontation with Russia after Russia dispatched over 6,000 troops to Crimea and surrounded several small Ukrainian military stations, demanding them to disarm. On Sunday, Ukraine's Navy chief defected to Russia after having been appointed just a day before. Russia has also been staging military exercises involving 150,000 troops along its border with Ukraine. Shin Semin, Arirang News. So is Ukraine really on the brink of war? Where can it go from here? Well, from the country's deepening internal divide to what the West and Russia want, Arirang News' Song Ji-sun takes a closer look into this crisis. Ukraine warned Sunday was on the brink of disaster and any invasion would mean war. Both Russia and the West say they want a peaceful resolution, but they're at polar opposites on the fundamental question of who is the legitimate authority in Ukraine. Western powers say it is a new interim government in Kiev authorized by the Ukrainian parliament. Russia says Kiev is in the hands of an illegitimate government of far-right extremists in salt as a result of a coup that ousted President Viktor Yanukovych. Moscow wants the West and Kiev to go back to the agreement signed with Yanukovych, told discussions about constitutional reform but that would effectively mean recognizing the new Ukrainian government as illegitimate. Although the conflict has intensified, the deployment of Russian troops to Crimea has not yet led to bloodshed. Western powers, backed by NATO and the White House, are calling on the Kremlin to send its military forces back to Russian bases and to refrain from any further interference in Ukraine. But if Russia reinforces the troops in Crimea, or deploys more troops to other parts of Ukraine, the violence may be hard to avoid. Ukraine, sandwiched between Europe and Russia's southwestern border, has been plunged into chaos since the ouster of President Yanukovych on February 22nd, following bloody street protests that left dozens dead and hundreds wounded. Ukraine faces a deepening internal divide. Those in the West, the majority of whom speak Ukrainian and are more liberal, generally support the interim government and its European Union tilt. But the better off, Russian-speaking eastern half prefer a Ukraine over which Russia casts a long shadow. Song ji Arirang News. Now back here in this country, turning now to the political announcement that changes the nation's political landscape significantly. The leaders of Korea's two opposite parties on Sunday announced plans to launch a new party that they say will be up and running ahead of local elections in June. Our Park ji reports. Following the surprise merger plan announced by the two leaders of main opposition blocs, Democratic Party leader Kim Han-gil and An chol su of the New Political Vision Party will start touring the nation from Wednesday to prepare the groundwork for the new party. Both agreed to complete necessary procedures of forming the new party before the June local elections by jointly setting up a preparatory committee comprised of five members from each party. Both parties aim to push ahead for the creation of the new United Party as soon as possible and to achieve a transfer of power in the presidential election in 2017. They said the new party will not nominate candidates for local council and world elections in the upcoming June elections, such as municipal council elections and local district council elections. 
The major party's nomination for local council member elections has long been considered a source of corruption and bribes. We decided not to nominate candidates for local wards and local council member elections in the June elections. This decision has been made after pondering what choices would be necessary to achieve the transfer of government in 2017. The new party will focus on the livelihoods of the people and on establishing a fairer economic system, along with a focus on launching further investigations into the spy agency's meddling in the 2012 presidential election. However, political insiders say they expect some friction during the merger process. The announcement of the coalition came as a big surprise, especially considering An Chol-su declared just a matter of weeks ago that he would launch his own new political party. An says he felt reassured about the merger plan when the DP decided to give up the controversial nomination system. The DP convened a general meeting of its assembly members on Monday to discuss future direction of the coalition. The ruling Senuri party denounced the merger, calling it collusion that is purely aimed at short-term political gain at the June elections. Park ji Arirang News. And the ruling Senuri party will field three political heavyweights for the Seoul City mayoral race in the upcoming June local election. Representative Chung Mong Jun, a former presidential candidate, officially declared his bid for the Seoul mayoral election on Sunday. The seven-time lawmaker, however, made it clear that he will not run for president in 2017 if he wins. Meanwhile, former Prime Minister Kim Hwang Shik is set to throw his hat into the ring upon his return from an academic visit to the U.S. Former two-term lawmaker Lee Hae-hun already announced her bid last month. The winner out of the three candidates in the ruling party's primary will face incumbent Seoul Mayor Park won soon of the opposition Democratic Party. President Park Geun-hye on this Monday nominated veteran central bank of official Lee ju yeol as new governor of the Bank of Korea to succeed Kim jung soo After starting work at the nation's central bank in 1977, he held key positions including head of the research department and senior deputy governor in charge of chartering monetary policies. The National Assembly will hold a confirmation hearing for E within the next 20 days. Finance Minister Hyun Ozak says the government will try to establish a fairer taxation system and collect more taxes from wealthy business owners. During an event commemorating Taxpayers' Day in southern Seoul this Monday morning, Hyun said he'll create a tax payment system that everyone can be satisfied with. He also said the country needs to create an atmosphere where companies and individuals that pay their taxes are well respected. And the number of corporate affiliates has declined slightly compared to the previous month. The Fair Trade Commission said Monday that as of March 1st, the number of corporate affiliates in Korea had dropped to 1,686, down eight affiliates from the previous month. The commission said that 13 affiliates of companies, including Lotte and Puyang, were excluded following mergers and acquisitions and other reasons while five companies, including Kumo Asiana Group and Tunglu Group, were added five new affiliates. Citing preliminary figures from the World Trade Organization, China says it has replaced the United States to become the world's largest goods trader, while Korea has leapfrogged Japan to become China's number one importer. Arirang News' Nai Hung Kyung has this report. Korea became the number one contributor to China's import market for the first time in 2013. This according to the Korea Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade, as well as the Korea International Trade Association. The agencies say Korea beating Japan for the position was possible due to China's growing demand for Korean electronics and manufacturing goods. Data shows Korea's share in China's import market jumped 0.07 percentage point to 9.2% in 2013 compared to 2012, while that of Japan shed more than 1 percentage point to 8.2%.
The products China sought after the most from Korea were electronic integrated circuits. China imported more than $45 billion of ICs from Korea last year, a near 15 percent increase from the previous year. Analysts in Seoul, however, warn because China is attempting to boost its domestic demand, Korea should also come up with ways to accommodate Beijing's changing growth paradigm. Meanwhile, Korea's trade balance remained in the black for the 25th consecutive month in February, according to trade ministry data. However, February's trade surplus of $926 million was significantly lower than the same month last year, when it stood at nearly $1.9 billion. Officials attribute the fall to economic crises in emerging economies, coupled with slower-than-expected recoveries in developed economic powerhouses. Na hyun Gyeong, Arirang News. Tens of thousands of medical doctors here in Korea have announced that they will stage a one-day strike next month, Monday, and then a six-day-long one starting March 24th. The Korean government, however, says it will not just sit and let a medical crisis unfold. Our UDN has this story. With an overwhelming yes vote of almost 80 percent, the Korea Medical Association has decided to go ahead with a nationwide walkout from March 10th. The protest is the first in 14 years, and given that over half of all practicing doctors nationwide participated in the vote, it could potentially deal a huge blow to the medical industry and to patients in need of medical services. Doctors in Korea are furious about a government plan announced late last year to introduce telemedicine in for-profit hospital subsidiaries. They're concerned such measures lay the groundwork for privatizing medical services. Doctors are feeling extremely desperate given the reality they are facing. So many will voluntarily take part in this strike. The Ministry of Health and Welfare is trying to reassure the public that the strike will not lead to that much inconvenience, given that they expect the participation rate to only be in the 20 to 30 percent range. The government has also vowed to take legal measures against those who take part in the strike. We have first ordered the hospitals to resume operations. If it does not do so, it will be suspended from the all business operations for 15 days. Both the ruling and opposition parties have slammed the decision calling on the medical association to call off to walk out for the sake of patients' health. But since both the government and the medical association are refusing to back down, not many are holding much hope for a compromise anytime soon. Yurian, Arirang News. Now, Samsung Electronics will adopt a wage peak system this year, a move expected to bring significant changes to the nation's labor market. Samsung's latest move comes as Korea's National Assembly passed a bill in April last year that would make it mandatory for the public sector and big businesses with 300 or more employees to extend the retirement age to 60 or above from 2016 and others from 2017. Well, for a closer look into this issue, we are joined live in the studio by Dr. Hwang jung wook a professor of law at Hankook University for Foreign Studies. Welcome to the program, Dr. Hwang. Thank you for having me again. Now, uh, Samsung announced that, one, it will raise the uh, retirement age from the current 55 to 60, and then, two, adopt a so-called wage peak system. Uh, could you briefly explain to us what this is? Exactly. As you commented in the intro, so what Samsung is doing is implementing the new retirement age of 62 years ahead of when it's required to do so by law. 
In exchange, what, is, uh, what it is asking the workers to take is that after age of 55, the wage peak system will kick in. That means that the workers whose age is above 55 will see their wages drop 10% a year. So the way to look at it is sort of a grand bargain that Samsung is giving to its workers. Yes, we'll give you retirement age, which is 60 from the current 55, but in return, you have to take the reduced pay after age of 55. Now, uh, Dr. Huang, is this the first time that Korea or uh, Samsung or, or it's been tried in Korea overall? It, it has been actually tried in different versions. There are some companies such as GS Caltex, Hyundai, uh, uh, heavy industries that have some versions of this system in place. What is significant it, it is that the, it is Samsung who's introducing this two-tier system in its, uh, all of its group companies. And Samsung being the representative company of the Korea, that's the significance. Just as to give you a one indicator of how dominant Samsung is in Korean economy, Samsung Electronics alone accounts for about 20% of the total public equity market in Korea. That is kind of unthinkable. You have to combine six biggest country, uh, companies in the U.S. to make up that kind of concentration in the U.S. Now, so how do you expect this, uh, do you expect this practice to spread to other companies in Korea? I do, because Samsung is the standard bearer of the Korean economy. Everybody sort of looks to Samsung about what they do, how they do. So I think the large companies will feel pressure to actually follow Samsung's lead. Where you will actually feel resistance will be the small and medium companies that, you know, under the law, they actually are now required to raise the retirement age until 2017. So we'll see some stiff resistance from the SMEs. Now, on the, um, the labor market, on, on the older workers, um, will this help these older workers here in Korea? Sure. I mean, currently, uh, under the law, you're supposed to retire at age of 55. So for those workers who don't have a you know, good backup plan after the retirement, this gives them extra five years to stay in the labor force. However, there are some concerns about this system as well. That is, you know, uh, because this is going to be uh, starting with Samsung and spread to bigger companies, we, we might actually see entrenchment of the two-tier market in the Korean labor market between large and smaller companies and between regular workers and dispatch workers. So it, it, that's a point of concern. And militant uh, labor unions might not like the reduced pay after 55. So those are some, some of the things we need to watch out for as this system goes forward. Now, Dr. Huang, um, is it true that this, uh, uh, this kind of a problem uh, for, the, uh, for the, the older workers and their uh, wage system is only confined to Korea and Japan? Basically, yes. Uh, what has uh, uh, developed in Korea and Japan is that companies usually promise lifetime employment. And in return, the wages are not really linked to the workers' productivity directly. So the pay system has been packed to the seniority. But as the e economies have changed both in Japan and Korea, that has broken down without the proper backup of the social safety net. It really has had created very similar and grave problems both in Japan and Korea. So uh, are, are you happy with the latest development? Sure. I mean, in the fact that in the absence of you know, vastly expanded social uh, uh, safety net, I think it does provide extra economic cover for workers above age 55. However, I think one thing that does need to change in general is the corp uh, Korean corporate culture. There is a saying in the Korean companies, Saojong, and literally means that 45 is a de facto retirement age. Basically, Korean cult, cult, uh, corporate culture is such that if you get to a certain age, then people don't like you to be, work as a subordinate if you're older. Unless that culture changes, even if the companies actually might put in the actual written policies, the practice might not change at all. And that, that could be based from uh, a Korea's Confucianist uh, thinking and its uh, logics there. So um, we'd like to see the corporate culture change with the economic development as well. Absolutely. I mean, this is a one step towards making Korea and the labor market more flexible and more tolerant. And I do welcome the change. All right. Dr. Hung jong a professor of law at Hanguk University for Foreign Studies, thank you so much for speaking with us this thank you today. Very much. Now, moving right along, we are going to uh, now take a look at the weather conditions in your neck of the woods.
And that brings us to the end of this newscast. Thank you for watching. Do join us again in less than two hours' time on Early Dish Net 6.